blessings. So this video I'd like to speak a little about, one second, in this video I'd like to speak a little about um, biblical metaphors. So there's a weapon being fashioned against the church that states, and it's not entirely untrue, but in, in, in its application it is a mistruth that the Bible has metaphors. Yes, it does have metaphors. And it has metaphors which were actually lived. What do I mean by that? Well, there are teachings in the way Jesus lived his life that can be metaphorically applied to our lives. Okay, so this is a, a deep teaching, but I just want to first start with, what does metaphor mean? A figure of speech in which a word or phrase is applied to an object or action to which it is not literally applicable. Figure of speech, image, trope, allegory, parable. A thing regarded as representative or symbolic of something else. However, just because something is metaphorical or can be applied metaphorically doesn't mean that it didn't actually happen. So if, for example, you take the crucifixion of Jesus as an actual event that occurred, which it did, because there are historical accounts, extra biblical historical accounts, and the resurrection of Jesus occurred, because there are extra biblical historical accounts and 500 people in one place at one time saw the risen Jesus, more than 500. So how can we metaphorically apply the actual crucifixion of Jesus to our lives? Well, we can see that our, our flesh is being put to death. Not literally, not yet anyway. I'm still alive. But my flesh nature has been metaphorically crucified. It's dead. The flesh man is dead. So Do you see how there's an overlap? How a metaphor can go both ways? How the metaphor can be spoken as an allergy, an analogy, excuse me. What is an analogy? A comparison between one thing and another typically for the purpose of, an, of explanation and clarification, an, an, an analogy between the workings of nature and those of human societies, a correspondence or partial similarity, a thing which is comparable to something else in significant respects. So the explaining the mechanisms or the workings of one thing by giving an example, and it's often an example that somebody the person you're explaining to can relate to. So if you're speaking to a carpenter, you might use an analogy that is rele relevant to carpentry to explain to the man that knows carpentry. Who's, because he's dealing with it every day. It's not that he's silly and he can't, he can't understand anything else, but it's just more readily accessible to him because he's a carpenter. So an analogy um, can be utilised um, in, in this way too where 
a metaphor, something that's not actually physically lived, can be applied to an actual person's life and then something that is actually lived can be applied as an analogy to what's occurring metaphorically in the person's life. Do you understand what I'm saying? So let's simplify again. Jesus was crucified in real life. There are extra biblical accounts of this. But Jesus' crucifixion is metaphorical in that it speaks to the putting to death of the flesh. And in that sense, it is also an analogy for the putting to death of the flesh. It quite literally was Jesus laying down his flesh for our sins. But metaphorically, it can be applied to our putting to death our flesh nature and can be used in this way as an analogy. So there's both terms apply. However, because something is metaphorical doesn't mean that it didn't happen. So when something is said to have occurred in the Bible, that means it did. However, if you look at Revelation, many metaphors are used in a symbolic way. So, for example, the beast is referred to in Revelation, which speaks to the infrastructures of Satan on the earth. So it's, an, it's a symbol and a metaphor. Do you see? A thing regarded as representative or symbolic of something else. So this is what's meant by study to shew thyself approved. So we're to study the Holy Scriptures so that we understand context and interpret correctly. It's easy if you take one verse or one line of the Holy Scriptures and you say, Judge not, least you be judged. Okay, judge not, least you be judged. If you were to just take that sentence, you would think that that is not enough information to fully understand what's being said. So, if you don't read in context, and context simply means with text, with the surrounding text in that chapter. In context, with text, where's like the rest of the story, okay? So if you don't read the whole story to get the full picture and the con or the context of what's being said, how can you then apply meaning or, in other words, interpret what's being said. How can you apply meaning to, or to use a word, interpret what is being said? So interpret is, is the encompassing term for apply meaning to. So as Christians, we put our faith in Jesus and his Holy Spirit comes, quickens us and teaches us and gives us interpretation gives us the ability to rightly apply meaning once we have read in context what is being said and the more we read the more layers of understanding we receive it's like peeling the layers of an onion have you ever heard that so
study to show thyself approved. So to continue using this example, judge not, least you be judged. Matthew 7, 1 to 3. Judge not, that ye be not judged. Or in another translation, it'll say, judge not, least ye be judged. It means the same thing. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou mote in, uh, that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Now, just in case you struggle or are slower to pick up the old English, I'm just going to get a newer English vernacular, I think is the right word. Judge not, that you be not judged. Now, that's a sentence. If you just take that sentence, say, judge not, that you be not judged. It doesn't really give you a gauge, because if you're to walk through a doorway, you have to judge the distance, so you don't bump into the door frame. So that's a form of judgment. So we can deduce then that there's more than one form of judgment. So you really have to, when you're reading the Bible, you really have to switch on your powers of deduction. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Okay, so. Two, let's say five. Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye. And look, the plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do you see what's being said here? It's saying, judge not that you be not judged. It's not, uh, it's not saying use no judgment at all. It's saying that apply care when judging and make sure that when you are attempting to edify, which means intellectually improve or improve the behavior of somebody, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. So what's being said is when you attempt to do that, when you attempt to edify your brother, that you should be in a position where you're not doing the thing that you're telling him not to do or edifying him about. So for example, if you're sitting there drinking gargle all day long, and saying to the guy sitting on the bench beside you, you, you have a drinking problem. You need to sort yourself out. Get to an AA meeting or something. And you're sitting there on the bench and you're sitting there on the bench and you're drinking the whole bottle of vodka. Well then, that's the definition of a hypocrite. 
and that's what the Bible says get your get the bottle out of your face for longer than a few seconds before you tell your brother to get the bottle out of his face and that can be applied that's just an analogy but it can be applied in any situation with respect to any type of harmful behavior say you're gonna to have to stay out of those nightclubs at the weekend cut to the next scene you're bopping in the disco oomts, oomts, oomts. a few doors down that's hypocrisy so unless you do and you behave in a manner that doesn't show you as a hypocrite that you walk as they say walk the talk in other words live the way you're encouraging others to live be an example practice as or they say practice what you preach walk the walk walk the talk and so on you see society has phrases go-to phrases for these to encapsulate these wisdoms you'll notice that and they're they're culturally rounded off but unless you actually go into the Bible and attempt to unpack what's being said and apply your powers of deduction you might not you might not be able to pick that up as quick as somebody else you might need plain English so that's where the Bible comes in for us the Bible is the source of wisdom not man man is flawed the Bible is the true source of wisdom the true Word of God you see the problem with society is society will apply wisdom but deny its head who is Jesus Christ and the Bible says that it says they have a form of godliness but denying its head and its head is speaking about Jesus the Creator to whom wisdom belongs so what's being said and why is it important that we don't just take a sentence from the Bible and you and and fashion it as a weapon to come at the preacher with on the street judge not least to be judged no way would you you see it's like they're trying to make the preacher look as though he's a hypocrite as though he's there preaching on the street and because it's 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 like a, a set piece you know uh, what do you think about this sin oh oh you're not allowed judge because the bible says judge not least you be judged oh you didn't get me but if you wait around for the answer we can have a discussion judge not that you be not judged for with what judgment you judge you will be judged so what's being said there saying if you set yourself up as judge the gavel and the lot do, 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 and you say to your neighbor you have to stop doing this and away you go and do it then that's the definition of a hypocrite what does a hypocrite mean what do a hypocrite mean that's how somebody from Enniscorthy would say it a hypocritical person okay doesn't help us what is hypocritical then hypocrisy actor wow from the Greek word actor via ecclesiastical Latin from Greek who po 
hypocrites, actor, a hypocrite, an actor, like somebody putting on a show. You're only sure you're only pretending. You're only playing at it, as they say. You're having us on. So there you are setting yourself up with a judge, as a judge. So if you set yourself up as a judge with a standard that's unique to you, then that will be the standard that you'll be judged by. And that's what God is saying. And God has a perfect standard of judgment. He's saying, you want to be a judge? Well, let's apply your standard to you. That's what's meant by judge, not least to be judged. Make sure that the standard you're choosing to judge with is a standard you're living by. But more than that, make sure the standard you're living by is the standard that God commands you to. And if the standard you're living by is what God commands you to live by, then you are in a position to edify your brother. When you remove the ungodly living, the willfully, deliberately ungodly living from your life, the one you, you engage in on an ongoing basis, then you're in a position to talk, as they say. You often hear, you do that, then you can talk. That would be another cultural saying. Sure, you can't talk. That's what we used to get in Kildare growing up. You can't talk. I saw you the other day. So people innately know that you shouldn't be judging people by a standard you don't keep. It's, a, it's, it's hypocritical. Okay? So that goes to show that we have a standard, a conscience. God has endowed us with the knowledge to know, a knowledge to know, a knowledge to differentiate between good and evil. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? It might look be something, something small he's doing. Oh, I saw. Like forensically with a fine tooth comb. You know? Oh, I saw you doing. And you have a big plank in your own eye. How can you even see past that it's that big? See what I'm saying to you? And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider? That's what's being said here, very clearly. There's a picture being painted by the word of God. It's beautiful. His word is beautiful and layered. Judge not, but you have to want to understand. If you, if you, read, if you read anything choosing not to understand, you're not going to get it. And even if you do get it, you won't admit to getting it. And then you'll try to miseducate everybody around you because you just want them to have the same opinion as you so you can feel easy around them. Feel at ease. Birds of a feather. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye but do not consider the plank in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So when you come along and, and you're preaching on the street and you say, turn from sin, sin leads to hell, and somebody say, well, what? give me an example of sin, or what do you think about this, or what do you think about that? And then you give a biblical answer, and they say, oh, judge not. 
The Bible says, judge not lest ye be judged. But unless you apply that in context, it's lost on you. So, when somebody wants to understand how the difference or to rightly divide would be a better expression the word of God into literal account and historical account and metaphorical um, yeah yeah me metaphorical or analogical um, comparatives is the right word I'm learning as I go here as well yeah um, I think that's right comparatives so you can you can know Sorry if I've lost track. You you can you can know the difference between what has happened literally and what is a metaphor, but even though something is a metaphor, doesn't mean it's not going to occur literally. So metaphors can be used in a prophetic manner to prophesy future events even literal future events events that will really occur in the earth when you read revelation you'll see metaphors being used there or you can even use actual historical events that occurred and apply them metaphorically to your own life so when somebody turns around and says ah oh, the bible's just a bunch of metaphors that's a really flippant dismissive and often deliberate weapon formed to misinform people as to the nature of the Bible and its and the intention of the Bible and the source of the Bible. So when you understand that God's very creation, the very earth, the way it's formed is metaphorical. When you begin to understand that, then it's absolutely true to say the Bible is full of metaphors, but it's not just metaphors. That's an untrue statement. It's just a bunch of metaphors. No, it's not just metaphors. It is filled with metaphors. Even its accounts of actual happenings can be applied metaphorically. And to give you that example again, when Jesus was crucified on the cross at Calvary, you can apply that metaphorically to your own life when you are putting to death the sin nature. So somebody's flesh nature can be put to death simply by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. You pass from death to life in that moment. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will pass from death to life. You will be laid to death and your life will be hidden in Jesus Christ forevermore. And then everything else that comes against you in this temporal realm is designed in such a way to bring your betterment. It will be fashioned by God. He said, what, what you meant for evil, 
In other words, what your enemies meant for evil against you, God meant for good, for your betterment. What they meant for evil, God meant for good. And the Bible says, God works all things for the good of those who love him. So the Bible also says, if God be for me, who can be against me? Because I think often people might be thinking, but all my friends, what would they think of me if I started picking up the Bible and reading it? And But then you're operating in a spirit of shame. And putting your faith in Jesus will deliver you from that spirit of shame. That's the thing. So whatever the barrier is to picking up the Bible, putting your faith in Jesus will remove that. So that you'll not only be able to pick up the Bible, but you will get a down payment of God's Holy Spirit. And then he will quicken you to understand what's in the pages. And to rightly divide, the Bible says, study to show thyself approved and rightly divide the word of God. That wasn't an easy topic to deal with, um, but I think it's necessary to deal with it. Because it's a very deep um, topic. But really, I, I think only God's Holy Spirit can bring you on that journey. So I, I could only re really deal with it topically but the Holy Spirit will give you revelation in, in great depth and that's really your journey with God that's your own personal journey with him when you put your faith in, in him Interesting. It has an idea in it which I can op only express by a figure. Rightly dividing or straight cutting. A ploughman stands here with his plough and he ploughs right along from this end of the field to the other, making a straight furrow. And so Paul would have Timothy make a straight furrow right through the word of truth. Hmm. So not deviating, rightly dividing. Or somebody might say, something like 
some often people will take the angle um, that because of the ceremonial Levitical laws that say a preacher would not be um, following um, in, t in today's societies such as not wearing mixed fabrics so what you must understand first is that the Levitical ceremonial laws the sacrificial offerings um, the uh, cleansing ceremonies were a shadow a foreshadow of things to come so they were representative of the lamb who would be slain to pay for the sins of men eternally and so when Jesus died on the cross at Calvary he fulfilled the law and this means that we no longer as Christians need to partake of the ceremonial Levitical laws in order to walk with God because now Jesus reconciles us back to him by faith in him because he paid for sin for all of eternity so he's eternally interceding with his blood because the blood of bulls and goats could never atone for the sins of men so all of the ceremonies that go along with um, the um, sacrificial offerings the blood offerings or the or the even the food laws no longer apply because Jesus fulfilled the law he said I have not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it so now by faith in Jesus Christ we are washed sanctified and justified so that's a rather simple way of explaining it but the but the the way somebody might approach the preacher today and say oh you're not, you're wearing mixed fabrics so that means i can do this sin no or you're you're not following this other ceremonial Levitical law so I can do that sin or you're a hypocrite telling me to stop sinning because you're not even following the laws in the Bible that say you know you should you shouldn't be wearing the clothes you're wearing So that's their lack of understanding or their deliberate refusal to accept what's being said in order to mislead others. Or it's something somebody told them that they're now armed with a bullet they have in the barrel as such ready to go at the preacher because they heard it elsewhere. And now by association when they see the preacher they think well, I have this to say to him. But because they lack perhaps the, the complete understanding, because they haven't actually read the Bible from the Old Testament to the New and understood what was actually occurring in the temple with the sacrificial offerings and, underst and understood what occurred and what was fulfilled for all of eternity on the hill of Calvary when Jesus laid down his life if they don't understand the progression yet use this to purport that the Christian preacher is hypocritical because he's not following 
uh, food laws or the um, wearing the proper attire or as would be necessary in Levitical times during um, the, the sacrificial um, offerings. But we know as Christians that Jesus intercedes in eternity because he's passed into eternity and now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. So he laid down his life on the hill of Calvary, atoned for all of the sins of mankind forever. And now those who put their faith in him pass from death to life with him even if they're still here in their flesh because it's a supernatural occurrence just like the change of heart in a man the change of his nature he no longer wants to sin it doesn't mean that the desires are no longer in his flesh they are the flesh is the flesh it's fallen it's a fallen vessel it's an unholy mesh But it is, it does exhibit God's creative glory. It is a beautiful creation. So, what we must understand is that while we're in this flesh as Christians, we're here to serve Jesus so why would man pass from death to life and remain in the flesh Paul said to live is Christ and to die is gain so to live is to serve Christ what does Christ mean it means sent by God. It means divinely appointed. It means anointed. These are all synonyms. The simplest terms are God sent. To live is God sent. So now God is sending us as believers in Jesus to be the light of the world by obeying Jesus what does Jesus mean the salvation of God what is the salvation of God but the light of the world it is the light of the world that leads people to salvation who is salvation Jesus Christ the God sent rescuer that's what Jesus Christ means so Jesus paid our for our crimes against the kingdom of heaven and now we can be reconciled we can become citizens of heaven again even though we're in the flesh by putting our faith in Jesus and we pass from death to life and we have our solid belief hope faith and love because we've put our faith in Jesus. We're now standing on solid ground that we do his work and he facilitates it because he lives in us. The Bible says the one in me is greater than the one in the world. And so we have such a desire and a drive to do the work of God that we do it every day it takes up most, if not all, of our headspace. <laughs> because to live is Christ. To live now for a Christian is Christ. And that's what the Bible talks about. Death for a Christian is, is rest for him because his labours follow him. So, whilst, yes, Christians live and 
take care of their household and love their families and, and do all that they're required to do as good servants and good keepers of households and families. But their priority is serving Christ. That's their foremost and utmost priority. However, so important is caring for your family that Jesus said the man who does not care for his family has departed from the faith. The man who does not is not willing to care for his family because you can't force yourself on people. You can't. And that's why the enemy knows to attack the, the family unit. To separate people and families and stuff like that because it gives them opportunity to go in. See if a father can't be with his child because the mother doesn't want him there then the enemy can go in and start speaking to the child's mind saying daddy doesn't want you, daddy doesn't love you, if he loved you he'd be here. It opens up opportunity for the demonic to, to move in. That's how insidious and evil the enemy is. Plus, if daddy's a Christian and he would bring his child up a Christian, but mommy doesn't want that, well then there's going to be a separation. If she leaves, you have to let her go. And remain celibate. especially to honour the child. To honour God and even to honour the ex. Do you see how important faithfulness is to our God? And how we're supposed to honour everyone. Amen. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And when you're removing a speck from somebody's eye, what must you be? very precise blessings beloved do you see how your powers of deduction must be switched on blessings Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords I love you brethren a holy kiss